Let's begin with the story of creation to help explain our biblical model. The Bible clearly says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. It tells us that God told man, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Well, how could they obey this command if God did not build in heterozygosity? You see, God built into us, originally, all the ability for mankind and beast alike to have the capacity to be fruitful and to fill the earth. But how could this original plan have worked if we were all clones and homozygous at all gene positions? Adam was created perfect, and Eve the same. Each cell in their body would have had two versions of each gene, a dominant and recessive. When they had offspring, their children would not be affected by inbreeding because of this extreme amount of genetic differences built in. Through time, though, alleles begin to shift. Sometimes, recessive alleles replace dominant ones and shift from heterozygosity to homozygosity. Meaning, now an offspring will only have one allele option instead of two at any particular gene location. Meaning, that if their mate also has this problem, then their offspring are stuck with having less genetic diversity because they can only ever have the same outcome at that gene site. We say that the more rare the allele, the more likely it was created. This is because rare alleles were found to be in heterozygotes, such that a new recessive mutation can't be seen by natural selection until it reaches a high enough frequency to start appearing in homozygotes. So it is clear that heterozygosity is favorable and what God designed as optimal, and shifts have been made from that state to a more inferior state. Since man does not speciate, nor ever will, we are more blessed in the fact that humans will retain more heterozygosity because of this. But animals do speciate over time, and generally have faster generational times. So they shift more rapidly to a homozygous state. And we see this today. We see it with horses, dogs, cheetahs, and animals that interbreed. But before we get into this, let's talk about the flood bottleneck. We are told by skeptics that this is impossible to take a single pair of animals, throw them onto a boat, and have them get off and diversify and fill the world with what we see today. But this criticism can be easily refuted and answered with observation. Take for example in 1957, a basal clade of heterozygous mouflon sheep left on the Kruligan Islands near the Atlantic Circle. Then, in 1977, just 20 years later, they had returned and the number had grown to 700. Now, because these sheep were heterozygous, they were able to thrive. But as time goes on, these sheep will speciate and they will shift into homozygous dominant genotypes to eventual homozygous recessive genotypes like sheep left in isolation today. And over time, we do see this. This animal you are looking at is generally known as the Shushvoshki or pea horse for short, but the Mongolians call it Taki, which means spirit, are worthy of worship. You don't ride a Taki or stable it. The horse is far too wild for that. While it has been captured and occasionally confined to zoos, not one has ever been tamed. It is the only true wild horse left in existence. After World War II, the population dropped to just 31. The only living breeding horses were living in Munich, but only nine of them ever reproduced. Because of their inability to be tamed and hatred of confinement, they rarely reproduced, and by the 1950s, the breeding population had fallen to 12. This became one of the most endangered horses in the world. Out of fear, their last resort was to release them into the wild. The 12 horses were able to easily diversify once again. There are roughly 2,000 in Mongolia now. Another perfect example of a small population diversifying and populating the lands. Exactly what they said the animals off the ark could not do. But we're not done yet. Oh no. Another example comes from Finland in 1934. 
only four white-tailed deer were introduced from North America, just one male and three females. Their numbers rapidly increased, and the species is now one of the main wildlife species hunted in Finland. The population is completely isolated from North America, so there is no chance that the numbers could have grown by outside contamination. In 2012, they were found to have populated so much that they are now the leading species in Finland, all from just one male and three females. So we have yet again another observable example of what critics say wasn't possible. Yet, it's obvious and clear that a critically small population can produce huge diversity and populations that we see in the world today. New species should be, well, better, more adept to their environment, and have more ability to diversify. Because when you have a homozygous species, it can never increase in diversity, and it can never return to its parent species. Dolo's law of irreversibility shows us this. Yet they want us to believe that mutations over time can fix this problem, contrary to what we see in reality. Think about it like this. Once parents become homozygous, all future offspring of that species stand no chance. They can never return to their once former heterozygous state, unless they are lucky enough to breed with another species of their own kind that has a different allele at that gene site. So starting with a larger diversity, many different combinations of chromosomes can be generated rapidly. But as time goes on, migration events can isolate populations, the isolated populations can become more homozygous because of interbreeding, DNA variety can be lost due to chance, infertility, small numbers of offspring, some individuals never mate, there are lots of reasons. But the more homozygous a population becomes, the less it resembles the original population. Speciation occurs when a subpopulation has become isolated and moves towards homozygosity. This is our model in a nutshell. The matter of fact, we can even see a perfect example of this in the Bible itself. Remember when Jacob took out the spotted, speckled, and striped sheep and gave them to Laban? Well, what Jacob unknowingly did was he gave Laban all the recessive homozygous sheep, which can only ever reproduce more of the same recessive offspring, as where Jacob kept for himself the heterozygous sheep. Fortunately for Jacob, he didn't need to know anything about genetics. All he had to do was obey God.